This is the tragic story of Lana Hollingsworth, a 61-year-old who had recently retired from her work as a loan officer for a mortgage company. She was a kind, loving, and compassionate woman who volunteered in her spare time. In June 2011, she and her husband were staying in their holiday home in the Pine Top Country Club, a community 200 miles northeast of Phoenix, Arizona. It was late in the evening on Tuesday, June 28, 2011, and Lana stepped outside her home with her dog. She was taking it for a walk before bedtime around the sports village area of the country club. The air was still. A gentle warm breeze rustled the leaves in the trees as Lana walked around the grounds of the country club. Apart from the rumble of cars passing by on a nearby road, the neighborhood was quiet. Lana had taken a stroll through the country club countless times before. It was routine for her when they visited the area. She loved her dog like one of the family, and it was always a comfort to have her faithful companion by her side. But as she walked in silence that night, she suddenly heard a noise. It made her stop in her tracks. Her dog pulled at its leash and started to bark. In the gloomy, dusky light, Lana could make out a large shadow just 60 yards away. There was a commotion, the sound of glass bottles clinking together, rustling, and a series of thuds and bangs. A shadow then dropped down from a dumpster and landed on the sidewalk. It was a bear, a large, 250-pound male black bear scavenging in the trash. It sniffed the air and turned its head. It had sensed Lana and her dog standing a short distance away. It wasn't startled by their presence. It was bold. It was on the hunt, and it ran towards Lana. The stocky, powerful limbs propelled it forwards as it charged at the terrified woman. Its ears were pinned back against its head. Saliva dripped from its jowls, and its eyes were fixed on Lana. She was gripped by a feeling of terror and let out a yell. She turned to flee, but the bear was upon her so quickly she didn't have time to react. It pounced onto the back of her, and she fell forwards. As she hit the sidewalk, she banged her head on the hard concrete. Then she felt the bear on top of her. It instinctively went for her neck and the back of her head. Lana tried desperately to protect herself. She wrapped her arms around her neck and tried to curl up into a tight ball, but the power from the ferocious bear was too much. Lana screamed. Her desperate cries were heard by those in the neighborhood. They came rushing outside. The scene that unfolded in front of them was shocking. They could see Lana kicking and thrashing about underneath the huge black bear. She was almost entirely covered by the animal, its thick, shaggy coat covering its round body and powerful paws swiping at the victim beneath it. Some ran to their cars and sounded the car horns in a desperate attempt to scare the animal away. They shouted and clapped their hands, running towards the bear and waving their arms above their heads. This seemed to work. The noise and the commotion scared the bear, and it leapt off Lana and ran up a nearby tree. Lana lay dazed on the ground. Her dog had run away, and she felt the searing pain from the rips and tears to her body and head. She cried out for help, but in a moment of pure horror, before anybody could get to Lana and assist her, the bear scrambled back down the tree as quickly as it had scarpered up and ran at Lana again. It was hungry. It saw Lana as prey, and this was a predatory attack. In the frenzy, the bear was focused on its victim, on immobilizing it and securing a meal. This was instinct. Lana was losing blood. She was now in a semi-conscious state, but she still tried to push the bear away with her arms. Slashes across her hands and forearms were testament to the incredible fight she put up. As locals continued to try and scare the bear away, it leapt off the 61-year-old once more and backed away momentarily before returning to her a third time. It was relentless. This time, one of the neighbors ran at the bear. It was too terrible to watch, seeing someone being torn apart like that. Finally, the bear ran away, its lumbering outline disappearing into the darkness. The emergency services were called, and hearing all the commotion, Lana's husband Marv rushed outside. He couldn't believe what he saw, his wife laying covered in blood on the ground. 
He ran to her and crouched down by her side. He held her hands in his and told her that everything was going to be okay, but he didn't know if it would be. But Lana knew her time was up. The life had been sucked out of her and she could feel herself fading. She looked into Marv's eyes and said the most devastating thing a partner could hear. Marv, I love you. I'm going to die. Please take care of the dog. Marv started to pray. He held his wife in his arms and prayed for her to make it. The two of them were inseparable, and losing her was more than he could bear. Lana was rushed to Scottsdale Healthcare Osborne Medical Center in critical condition. Nobody knew if she was going to make it. The doctors put her into a medically induced coma whilst they operated on her battered body. She underwent seven surgeries in as many days. As she lay there, unresponsive, Marv continued to pray. Family members set up a fundraiser to help pay for the medical bills. It was the least they could do. Her injuries sustained from the attack were not covered by her medical insurance, so it was all Lana's friends and family could do whilst they waited and hoped for her recovery. As the days ticked by and turned into weeks, it looked like Lana might make it. The medical staff were hopeful for her recovery. She was fighting back. Some of her wounds were healing, and her vital signs were improving. She received 11 operations in total to repair her scalp that had been torn away and the deep defensive wounds on her arms. But in a cruel twist of fate, Lana suddenly took a turn for the worse. Unbeknownst to the doctors, a new strain of bacteria was overcoming Lana's body. This bacteria was surging through her, likely from the bear's claws, and hadn't responded to the antibiotics. Suddenly, her skin grafts weren't taking, and her vital signs began to plummet. Her body was shutting down. The medical team raced to try to determine what bacteria were causing the intense infection, but no matter what treatment they tried, it wouldn't work. Four weeks after being admitted to the hospital, Lana was struck by a massive brain hemorrhage, which was thought to be caused by the bacteria. She died on the night of July 25th, 2011. It was a terrible and tragic end to Lana's life. It had been a completely unprovoked attack, and one which deeply concerned the sheriff's office and the state's game and fish department officials. The bear had behaved extremely aggressively and had not been deterred by the attempts from locals to scare it away. Immediately following the attack, the bear was hunted down with the help of sniffer dogs. It was found about a mile away and was shot and killed. It was the only way that officials could ensure the public's safety. It was thought that recent wildfires and droughts had driven bears to search further afield to find food. This male bear had become desperate in the search for something to eat and had been attracted to the neighborhood by the smell of food and trash found there. On that fateful night, it had seen Lana as a credible target and a potential meal, attacking her ferociously. Forensic tests carried out after its death confirmed that it was the bear responsible for Lana's attack. Lana had a large family who had struggled to come to terms with her loss. Between Lana and Marv, there were 16 grandchildren and 13 great-grandchildren. She always tried to make a stressful situation better through her compassion and caring nature. One of her volunteer roles involved her dressing up as a clown to bring some cheer to patients in local hospitals. She began volunteering with the Gilbert Fire Department in 2007. Among her volunteer roles, she was a community emergency response team member, a community assistance volunteer, and CPR instructor in her hometown of Gilbert. Her loss was felt all the way through the community. The last previous attack to take place in Arizona had occurred five years earlier, in 2006. Lana had become the seventh victim of a bear attack in the state since records began in 1990. None of the previously recorded attacks had been fatal. Lana was the unfortunate first person to meet their terrifying final affliction. Fort Myers, Florida is the kind of place where a 20-year-old comes during spring break or on a wild party weekend with friends. But that wasn't why Michelle Reeves was in Florida for the weekend. She and her father James had come out to check on his parents who were also Michelle's grandparents. The pair had been retired and living in Fort Myers for almost 10 years now, and they seemed determined to ignore the fact that they were getting on in years. 
just the week before Michelle's grandfather got into his head that he was going to fix the gutter that had blown apart with the last storm of the summer. Predictably, Gramps had made it five steps up the ladder before he slipped and fell. Luckily, he hadn't made it very far up, or it would have been much worse. So now he sat with his broken ankle up in the air, making poor Gran just as miserable as he was. It wasn't James Sr. who had called for help. He'd never admit that he was at fault for his predicament. It was his wife, Diane Reeves, who called James Jr. to come over and give her a break from the grumpy 73-year-old and his blasted broken ankle. So James and Michelle flew in all the way from Roswell, Georgia, to cheer the old man up and to allow Diane some support. Michelle loved visiting Florida. Roswell was beyond boring, and the change in scenery was a much-needed one and she genuinely loved her grandparents. Besides, her term at Georgia University had been a busy one, and she was in dire need of a break from studies, activism, and her true passion, poetry. She wasn't planning on touching a computer or a pen for the next week. She needed the break from hard work just as much as her grandmother from Grandpa James. They arrived on Friday the 24th and were planning on staying well into the next week but Michelle drooped like a flower in the heat. Autumn was taking its time to arrive, and even though Roswell was a pretty warm place, it was nothing compared to Florida. After spending all day Friday unpacking and strolling around the neighborhood to greet the residents, Michelle expected the evening to bring a break from the heat. But no, it was just as hot and humid as it was during the day. Michelle spent that first evening tossing and turning, barely getting any sleep in at all. The next morning, before she and her father were going to start fixing the gutter, Michelle put on her bathing suit and headed out to the lake that the retirees' houses were built around. But Michelle's plans for a cool dip were cut short. Diane stopped her in her tracks just as she was about to walk out the door. There had been a few sightings in the past few weeks of a large seven-foot alligator in the lake, and she told Michelle to march her butt right back in and to get dressed. Until the thing was caught or when it decided to find another place to make its home, the entire community had been warned to stay away from the water. So Michelle spent the rest of the day in the scorching sun, holding the ladder while her father fixed the gutter then a squeaky window, and finally they repotted some of her grandmother's shrubs into bigger planters. By late afternoon, Michelle and James Jr. were soaked with sweat, and their cheeks were red from the Florida heat. Before her grandparents could dole out another job, Michelle sneaked off and hopped into a cold shower, leaving her father to clear the rest of the garden while James Sr. sat in a lawn chair, giving out orders. If it weren't for the heat, Michelle would have loved helping out. Her grandparents might seem critical and stern to others, but really, all of the scolding and bossing around was done good-naturedly, and with more love and cookies than Michelle's stomach could hold. The shower helped enormously, but by the time the night came again with its damp heat, Michelle was sweating all over again. Like the night before, she tossed and turned uncomfortably. She got up several times in the night to get a drink of water to cool off, and that's where Diane found her granddaughter in front of the fridge at one in the morning. Diane dished out some ice cream for the both of them, and they sat for an hour eating ice cream, talking about Michelle's next big projects at school. The ice cream sure helped when she was in the middle of eating it, but by three that morning, all of the frozen goodness was gone, and Michelle was right back where she started, tossing and turning another night away. Afraid that a cold shower this time of night would wake the whole house, the young woman slipped out the back door and headed out to the lake instead. Without her grandmother there to stop her, Michelle intended to take a quick dip. She'd be done before anyone was awake, and no one would even know she'd been gone all that time. The water should cool her off sufficiently enough to allow her to get at least a few hours of sleep. And since it was completely dark, there was no need to bother with a bathing suit. No one was going to see her outside at this time of night. With the crickets in her ears and the air outside as hot as it was inside the house, Michelle left her nightgown on the lake's shore and slipped quietly into the black water in an open space between some wild reeds. The opening held a few canoes that rocked lazily on the quiet water. 
the relief was instant. She didn't even bother to swim out. That would just create a necessary noise. She wasn't wearing anything, after all, and didn't want her family to see her naked. She wasn't ready for that kind of embarrassing moment. Michelle sat down, submerging herself up to her shoulders in the shallows. About six feet away from the girl lay a very confused animal. The alligator had been floating near the edge of the lake, resting right between two canoes. It was half asleep, and it hadn't even heard Michelle walk up to the lake at all. It wasn't until her feet stepped into the water that it jerked awake. The lizard was caught completely off guard and lay deathly still for a good minute, taking in the situation. Its initial confusion faded away after it noticed that the woman was so conveniently close that this would be a wasted opportunity if it let her go. The gator had eaten three days before, so it wasn't particularly hungry. But when a meal walks right up and presents itself to you, it would be almost inconceivable not to try to take it down. The seconds passed by, and the alligator crept closer. Michelle took no notice of the alligator's stealthy approach. It was seven feet long, just about the same size as the canoes it was swimming next to, making it easy to overlook. Michelle was wondering whether or not she should swim out after all, when she felt something hard and heavy nudge her arm. At first, she thought a log had drifted against her. It was definitely dark and bumpy enough to be a fallen tree. But then it moved with such speed and fluidity that she knew it was the alligator she'd been warned about. Before Michelle could even sort out whether or not to stay still or to run, its white teeth flashed in the moonlight. It clamped down on her right arm just above the elbow. Michelle let out one strangled cry, but before she could even get any volume behind her scream, she was twisted so violently that her shoulder dislocated, throwing her head first into the water ahead of her. The gator didn't need to get its prey into the deep water to drown her. It just needed to get her far enough to submerge her head. So, as it coiled around Michelle's body, it rolled from the shallow bank until it got about five feet from shore deep enough for the gator and Michelle to be fully submerged. As the alligator spun her in circles, Michelle's face managed to break the surface for a split second, but instead of letting out a cry for help, water flooded her mouth as she tumbled around back into the deep. Michelle had no chance. Her arm was ripped out of its joint at the elbow before she succumbed to drowning. With the amount of blood loss from her missing arm and her inability to breathe, it took less than two minutes for the young poet to die. As quietly as she'd snuck out of the house and into the lake, she'd been pulled into the depths and no one heard a thing. It wasn't until 10 a.m. that morning, with the sun already high in the sky, that James started looking for his daughter. He'd assumed that Michelle was sleeping in after the busy day they'd had yesterday. But when 10 o'clock came and went, he decided it was time to wake her up to get started on the broken air conditioning. But Michelle's bed was empty, and Diane mentioned that the back door was standing open that morning when she'd come into the kitchen to make breakfast. Not yet concerned, James walked around the property, thinking she'd gotten up earlier than them and gone for a walk. But his eyes fell on the yellow cotton nightgown lying in the grass next to the lake. And then, James knew something was terribly wrong. He ran to the place where the canoes were tied, and before he even reached them, he saw his daughter lying face down among the reeds. Her hair fanned out in the gentle current, and her body starkly gray against the brown water. Screaming, James dragged Michelle out, but her eyes were blank and her lips were blue. The ragged stump that used to be her arm was no longer bleeding like it would if she were alive, and her upper body was covered in red and angry-looking bite marks. Before the day was over, Michelle's remains had been taken away, and her murderer had already been found, lying in the sun, basking in the pleasure of the late morning heat. The animal was sluggish with its overfull stomach, so it didn't take much to dispatch of it. Wildlife and rescue were able to remove Michelle's arm and return it in time for her funeral after her terrifying final affliction. There are thousands of polar bears in Alaska, but despite this, attacks on humans are incredibly rare. 
Polar bears are apex predators, hunting seals, young walruses, and even sometimes beluga whales and narwhals. But occasionally they stumble into local communities on the search for food. In the small village of Wales, located on the Seward Peninsula on the western coast of Alaska, tragedy struck in January 2023. The close-knit community of about 150 people were going about their daily lives. The village, the westernmost on North America's mainland, overlooks the Bering Strait. The small settlement is rich in its cultural heritage. It is one of the most isolated settlements in America, a frozen landscape, a tundra of ice and snow. The weather had been terrible for the past few days. Strong winds whipped up ground-lying snow, creating whiteout conditions. The people of Wales were used to this. It was common for supplies to dwindle before planes flew in to restock. Once the entire community ran out of toilet paper, they didn't see a plane or helicopter for six weeks. That was part of the life here. The harsh conditions, but also the magical beauty of the landscape relatively untouched by man, a wilderness that beckons adventure and the exploration of the great outdoors. Summer Myomic, a 24-year-old mother and popular member of the community, was braving the elements. She was walking with her one-year-old son, Clyde Angtowasruk. It was January 17th, 2.30 in the afternoon. The pair were walking between the small school and medical clinic. There was nothing unusual about the day. The route Summer took was routine and unremarkable, but camouflaged against the backdrop of white was a predator, an apex predator that was top of the food chain. It was looking for a meal. It stalked towards the village. Its paws, 12 inches, 30 centimeters across, and bearing two-inch claws, trod firmly on the ground. Its lumbering gait was hidden from view by the poor visibility. It was making its way closer to the village. With every step, it was closer to its kill. It was a large polar bear. It stopped momentarily, raised its head, and sniffed the air. Its keen sense of smell had drawn it towards the village. Perhaps the scent of garbage had wafted on the air. Perhaps the smell of food or humans had enticed it inland. Able to detect a seal one mile away and hidden under three feet of snow, polar bears have an acute sense of smell. They are almost impossible to hide from outside in the elements. Sprinting at up to 25 miles per hour, you can't outrun them. Standing up to three meters on their hind legs, you can't fight them off. They are a formidable predator. Summer was just yards from Wales Kingekmuit school gates when she heard a commotion. The bear had entered the village. Screams rang out as terrified locals made a dash for cover. A house, a shop, a car. Unbeknown to Summer, the polar bear was on a rampage. It chased people as it thundered through the streets. It was hungry. It was on the prowl. When it spotted an easy meal, it made a run for it its huge, powerful body racing towards unsuspecting residents. But for Summer, who was just passing by the school, she had nowhere to hide, nowhere to run. And the polar bear spotted her outside the school gates. It ran at her, slowly at first, and then gaining speed. Its eyes were fixed on the young mother and her baby. Fearless and powerful, it came in for the kill. In a moment of panic, a moment of sheer terror, Children inside the school grounds began screaming. They could see the menacing bear coming in for the attack. It leapt onto Summer, knocking her to the ground. There was nothing she could have done. There was nothing young Clyde could have done. The pair were in the wrong place at the wrong time. They were no match for a 1,500-pound, 700-kilogram bear. Teachers from the school came running outside. They had heard the commotion. They could hear the screams from their terrified pupils and the cries from Summer and her boy. As the polar bear launched its attack, the teachers grabbed the children and rushed them inside. But the bear spotted them. It had made a kill and now it wanted more. It ran at the school doors, trying to force its way inside. The head teacher, Don Hendrickson, slammed the school door shut, bolting it from the inside. The polar bear's powerful front paws wrapped on the door. Would the door hold its weight, or would it buckle, allowing the bear to enter and wreak havoc amongst staff and students there? They all held their breath, not daring to move, not daring to utter a sound. 
The young children's faces were a picture of terror, their eyes wide open, their hearts in their mouths, as their teachers tried their best to keep them quiet. Staff locked the school down. They remained silent, listening, waiting, hoping upon hope that the door would hold out, that the bear would leave them alone. They drew the blinds on the windows. The bear couldn't see in. The people couldn't see out. They managed to get word to the community that there was a bear on the loose. A short while later, staff and students heard the crack of a loud gunshot from outside. Peering through the window blinds, they could see the polar bear. It lay slumped on the ground outside the school gates. It lay motionless. Still, it was dead. The weather had been so bad that whales had been inaccessible. Strong winds and blizzards had caused whiteout conditions. Lights on the gravel runway were undetectable. When weather is good, up to six small planes land on the gravel each day. But this lifeline to the outside world is tenuous. It is often cut when weather is bad. This time, help was a day away. State troopers arrived at the scene the next day. The attack on Summer was a haunting reminder of how fragile life is. She and her young son had their lives ripped away from them in a terrible way. Until then, locals had lived without fear from attack for more than 30 years. Despite being on the fringes of the Arctic Circle, polar bear sightings within the village are rare and attacks even more so. The district's chief school administrator, Susan Nedza, described the community as dealing with crippling grief. Summer was a much-liked young lady. She was sweet and kind, a devoted mother. The school was closed to the lessons for the rest of the week, but it was left open as a refuge for those who tried to come to terms with what happened on its doorstep. The school provided meals and counseling for those in need, people coming together at a time of grief. Jeff York, Senior Director of Conservation at Polar Bears International, was shocked and surprised by the attack. When asked to comment on the bear's behavior, he stated that the bear must have been desperate for it to have chased multiple people. It wasn't an opportunistic attack. It was in the village to make a kill, and it would stop at nothing until it had done so. Although immediately north and south of Wales, there is now water at that time of year instead of ice due to a warming climate, there is still plenty of ice close by for the bears to hunt on. It's very unusual for a polar bear to leave its typical hunting ground to search elsewhere. It doesn't make sense. But with less sea ice encouraging polar bears to hunt ashore and more human activity in the Arctic, attacks are on the rise. Community members in Wales developed a polar bear patrol program to keep its residents safe. Unfortunately, this was discontinued due to a lack of funding, a decision that had resulted in a mother and her one-year-old son meeting their unfortunate final affliction.